You ready, Max? Let's rock and roll. <laughs> ready, 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 ready. Perfect. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isa, and I am a bookseller at Politics and Throws Bookstore. And I'd like to welcome everyone to PNP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you, the authors you love, and their work to the Politics and Crows community. If at any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase the author's book, The Death of Francis Bacon, on the Politics and Crows website, and you can also find any of his other works. Additionally, you can ask uh, Max a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And while we will try to get to everyone's questions tonight, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. Finally, we want to thank you for being here with us today. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers and our new friends for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. So it is now my pleasure to introduce today's guest. Uh, Max Porter is the author of Lanny, which was a long listed for the Booker Prize, and Grief is the Thing with Feathers, the winner of the International Dylan Thomas Prize and shortlisted for the Garden First Book Award and the Goldsmiths Prize. It was adapted for the stage by the Irish playwright Enda Walsh. Porter is the recipient of the Sunday Times and the Peter Fraser and Dunlop Young Writer of the Year Award. Prior to his writing career, Porter managed the Chelsea branch of Daunt Books and won the Bookseller of the Year Award in 2009. He was also editorial director at Granta and Portobello Books until 2019. Currently, Max lives in, ba in Bath with his family. So about the book, a great painter lies on his deathbed, synapses firing, writhing and reveling in pleasure and pain as a lifetime of chaotic and grotesque sense memories wash over and envelop him. In this bold and brilliant short work of experimental fiction, Max Porter inhabits Francis Bacon in his final moments, translating into seven extraordinary written pictures of the explosive final workings of the artist's mind. Written as painting rather than about painting, Porter lets the images he conjures speak for themselves as they take their revenge on the subject who wielded them in life. The result is more than biography. The death of Francis Bacon is a physical, emotional, historical, sexual, and political bombardment. The measure of a man, creative and compromised, erotic and masochistic, inexplicable and inspired. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Max Parter to Politics and Prose Live. Thanks for having me. Hello, hello, Max, how are you doing? How's it going over there in Bath? How it's very, very nice. Yeah, we're all OK, <laughs> thanks. We're safe. We're well. Uh, we're not isolating. We're not locked down. Yeah. We are in the control of a bunch of crazed, um, sociopathic, corrupt crooks. But we're not alone in the world in that. So, oh, all right, yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> I guess like we are all, I guess you could say that in some ways we're all in the same boat. Um, mm. So... Before we get into any questions, I'd like to invite you to share with us like a reading from your book um, mm -hmm. and give the audience a taste of what they're looking for, or maybe just like, you know, share some of your favorite bits of the book and I will let you take the stage. Okay, thanks. So this is um, a novel which tries to create a kind of fantasia, a deathbed fantasia, um, way beyond anything um, in the realist mode, uh, in which a character who may or may not be the actual Francis Bacon confronts versions of himself, his own work, his legacy, his art historical and canonical representation, old friends, uh, old friends both on and off uh, stage and, and on and off the stage of Western art history. So Velasquez, Caravaggio, um, you meet dictators, specters, um, lovers, critics. And uh, the, the setup is um, a slightly uh, theatrical setup in as much as it is Bacon and his nurse. And they take turns to be Bacon and the nurse. Um, this is uh, it's set in five imaginary paintings. They don't relate to real paintings, but there's probably references to dozens of actual Francis Bacon paintings through the whole. Uh, this is painting number five, which is described as oil on canvas, 65 by 56 inches. This is about midway through the book. And every time Mercedes, the nurse, speaks to Bacon, 
she offers him a choice. At the beginning of every section, he invites her to take a seat. And at the end of every section, she tells him to try and get some rest. And that is, this, that is the theatrical setup. And in each of these kind of paintings slash encounters, she invites him to choose a story to be told. And usually the choice is between the painter Francis Bacon, which he is afraid of hearing until the very last climactic painting in the book, or a famous historical figure. And in this instance, it's the figure of Julius Caesar from a children's book that Francis Bacon bought in a charity shop on the Gloucester Road in West London. Take a seat, why don't you? Deacon? Oh, sorry, I thought I, I thought, I'm sorry, I, I smelled a friend of mine, Aqua de Colonia, peppermint, is chewing gum, Piggy. I can't breathe especially well, if truth be told. Julius Caesar or the painter Francis Bacon? She can't hear me, I'm, I'm asleep. I'm so drunk, I conked out in the cab and I said to him, how long have I been asleep? Broad daylight, sickening light. How long have I been asleep? Excuse me, how long have I been asleep? The meter was running at 700 quid. From Islington, for God's sake, man, did I sleep all day? And he turned around and it was Deacon. But he couldn't speak because he had a human fist in his mouth. Trotters. Knuckles spilling out, teeth marks on dead skin. John was clearly suffocating. His eyes were wide in panic. And I said, fucking hell, old chap, spit it out. And he grunted. <laughs> What's he saying? Shh, some of us are trying to speak. I can't breathe. The fist interrupts with a wet splunk like a dollop thud onto the canvas and leaves a stain. Deft impression, dent in the wet racing green. Rather good, actually. Shut up a second. Give some doggy movement to the great waste of her face. Rather good, actually. Canine to have something scampering, something squirming. So I wrung it out in a bucket, the saturated fist, and I used it like a cloth, swab, rubbed it back and forth against the nice clean flesh of the breast, and the whole shape of the thing was suddenly terribly clear. Uh, brilliant. All it needed was some movement, bloody clumsy, working from the photo, hiding, peeking, and a fist wobbling off like a tumour. Voila! Now the green makes sense. Sorry, am I repeating myself? I wonder if I could peel that neck of yours off and start again. Julius Caesar, please, I'm going to save my breath if you don't mind, dear. Brutus sits at the desk, clutching a severed hand, which behaves. He opens his fingers and rests his hot forehead in the palm, and it fits like a campaign, like a chore. He has a golden bowl to shit in. He has lamb and good wine. He has a canvas womb in which to toss and turn. No helmet or hood fits his head, as well as the dead slave's hand. History! <coughs> he doesn't look up. How clever you are. Scholarship. The Haunting of Brutus, from the marvellous children's book of ghost stories I found in Oxfam, on the Gloucester Road. Yes, yes, he doesn't... <laughs> Let me take over. I'll take over. Let me. In comes the ghost of Caesar. Yes. And Marcus Brutus gets the fright of his life. Flashback to stabbed Caesar. Folds of right. Purple rim. You. Marble. Cross hat. Dark arm hair. Correct me if I'm wrong, dear girl. Then the same traumatic memory, but a different shot of it. Quite a brilliant angle of the body as if we are lying on a tilted mezzanine. More blood in black. Good foreshortened spill. Eyes open. And in comes the dead senator. Robed man with puncture wounds. And I can and I will use that. Folds muscle, slightly you-know-who in the chin, which is why it alarmed me, self-portrait as ghost of Caesar, as royal baby, but then I lost the bloody thing. Some git nicked it from the studio, one of these shits who will write a god awful hack tosh hagiography of me after I'm gone. Oh, he was so scabrous, the monstrous, pitiable bacon up at the bar, buying us drinks. The figure pulled the robe aside and revealed a body running and glistening with blood. That's it, that's it, sweetheart, exactly. I thought I might do a lot with that. And of course, me being me, I'm clutching a ripped out portrait of little Don Carlos in one hand and I can't resist an unholy facial marriage, a quotation of sorts. And therefore suddenly, brilliantly, pinned for your eyes only, the infantis chin is kissing the punctured bowman's chest. I folded the head over at the eyes and laid it on the injury. You understand me, how I make these pictures work. Don't be unkind. Look, which begins. I look at you and you say, yes, master, yes, market. One more walk to the Prado, one more glass of bubbles. But my face doesn't move one millimeter, not even to stay, and I don't need to flinch, you're just any old executioner. Yes, now you're talking. I don't even turn around, head resting on the dead palm. I know it's Caesar or the King or George or Felipe. Knock, knock, knock. A nice right face on the chopping block for Mr. Bake on, ready whenever you are. Beg an eternal life, if you please. Come all the way down, all the bloody way down. No need to look, it's always the same picture. A little girl dying at 100 miles an hour, head lolling on the velvet chair. You don't need her here. 
You have everything I need. No point in staying, old boy. Tell Willie to leave them in the hall. Tell everyone to leave. Slow down. Breathe. Leave the photos on the floor and fuck off. I want to be alone. Great thumping load of brass and timpani banging on the wall, crashing on a major chord. He knew what had to be done. He gripped the hilt of the sword and turned the point against his stomach. See? Okay. Intento descansar. Not the intent, oh my. I've never read that one before, sorry. <laughs> that, I, I, I had like a whole bunch of questions ready, but I am absolutely floored. I was not prepared for a show tonight, but oh my God, that was, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is a perfect time for me to transition into um, one of the questions that an audience member asked today um, before I go into mine, because I think it's really relevant, but um, I'd love to hear more about the role of theater in your life and your work. Um, why don't you, like, do you have any formal theater background um, or do you just love reading um, dramatically? Because um, that was that was so amazing. Oh, that's nice. I mean, no, no I don't. I, I was in um, a very cool <laughs> music theater group when I was a kid, you know, uh, that was a a formative thing for me because it was a sort of it was well actually it was the roots I suppose of, of any hybridity there is in my work it was a music theatre company where humans were chairs and um, music was voice and voice was music. You know, it was a, it was a playful creative um, progressive space uh, and I you know it was a good time in my life it's where I did my first kissing you know <laughs> um, 13 year old acting uh, you know letting the, letting the creative energies flow but no, no theatre training at all. Um, <laughs> I've just seen another question. Now we're in the chat. I, I want to ask um, Rafi's question. Can I? Oh, yeah, absolutely. What is the miniature modernist home in the background? Thanks for asking. It's a, it's a Lundby doll's house. A 70s nice. Swedish doll's house. You can't quite see it. And I'll unplug my computer, but it's beautiful. Um, and we've, we've made it black. We've, we've painted it white and we fill it only with black and white objects. Um, cool. And we, my wife collects these Lundby toilets. Uh, we have them stuck up in our bathroom, but every now and then you can only buy the toilet if it comes with, you know, a, a sink or a, a chest of drawers. Or <laughs> I'm very into miniatures. I think um, I think the world of miniatures is a beautiful world. I'm I'm very I'm very impressed and enamored by people that spend their life making miniature things. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you see yourself like considering that as like a maybe second career? <laughs> maybe just going into making minutes later I, on? I, my hands are too big. I don't have the skills. <laughs> um, so I can only admire other people's work. Uh, well, you do create wonderful worlds in your writing. And speaking of writing, um, so let's get into the formal Q&A now. Um, so I, I'd like to know just, we talked about the pandemic earlier and how you're doing, but um, given that this recent work was written and published amidst a global tragedy or well everyone's still suffering through covid year two which is like hard mm. to believe and i'd like to know that writing about such a heavy subject i wonder if this had any influence on how you wrote um what you wrote and um i guess like as a caveat to that like or how it like how you're able to sort of avoid maybe despairing i suppose um, so yeah, why didn't you, I guess it's a bit of a grim topic, but uh, I feel like with everything that's happening, we, it would be yeah. nice to touch on as well. Well, I, I don't have any expertise in, in regards to um, the avoidance of despair. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, um, I would say in some respects, the job of the novelist is, is to professionalise uh, one's despair or at least one's um, anxieties or worry you know into the work translate it into into the work and this work isn't you know this wasn't my next big novel this was a thing that I wrote sort of by accident in lockdown but mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting to think to think back how it related to the experience of lockdown um, and to the sort of statistical bombardment of of death suddenly the the, the reality of death particularly um, in, of a respiratory nature. You know, Bacon died of a respiratory illness. He suffered from asthma his whole life. He was short of breath. And I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to make an analogy. I, I didn't want to use Bacon as a metaphor for anything that's occurring now. I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm trying to investigate his work and our relationship to it and my own relationship to it. But it was, um, 
it was a compulsion born of my of my frustration, I think, and, and the, the sense of the helplessness that we all felt. You know, we weren't, we, I, I, perhaps you are, so I don't know, but I'm not trained as an ICU now, a doctor. I can't, I couldn't go and help. And that was a frustrating thing. So one did as much as one could in, in, in the ways one can in a community or, you know, in the digital space. But ultimately, we were all quite powerless to do anything. We had to be in and we had to wait and see. And that created a kind of claustrophobia that I was interested in as a formal opportunity. How do you make a small, tight, frightened, uh, enclosure, like 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 the like the small, tight, frightened imaginary architecture that Bacon populates his pictures with, the perspex boxes, the th the, the chairs, the the grids, the sofas of, upon which you know the sort of cut up sofas and, and bits of half furniture that his characters appear to be imprisoned on, and that that I suppose had a lot to do with lockdown. Yeah, so that was when I started writing. It was sort of what would happen if I took the bake the bake the Bacon proposition. Of one or two figures pinned against space, mauled beyond recognition, or or walked or rubbed or 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 pushed beyond anything illustrative, and tried mm -hmm. to write a book about him that was beyond beyond the illustrative mode. You know, not not a biography, not a piece of art history. Whether fiction would be a useful tool to get at Bacon in some new way, or 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 try and sound a new note. Um, and then when I started to do it, I realised that that new note would have to relate specifically to myself as a novelist. Would it need pure prose? Could it be, would it, would it, what would it, how would it be on the surface? How would I smear? How would I drag? How would I, how would I, how would I make a uh, more oblique representation of the figure or the character? Um, and they were technical challenges, but they also, I think, uh, as you're alluding to, became um, emotional challenges and, or emotional problems to be peered at in, in lockdown as well. That's that's lovely. I think that art does have a way of kind of like making us reckon with like the different forces that are around us. And I think you did this beautifully in your work. Um, connected, to it, connected to this question, um, one of our audience members um, asked like if you were able to find catharsis when you were able to translate um, your own despair and grieving into your work. And mm -hmm. this doesn't just go with um, the death of Francis Bacon, but I suppose like how you covered um, grief um, in grief is a thing with feathers as well um would you like to speak on that i catharsis is such an interesting concept and i think that our understanding of it now in the sort of in the sort of therapeutic sense or in the kind of in the sort of framework of narratives of recovery is slightly different to its original meaning i know with francis bacon i think my 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 worry my interest my the allure of him as a, as, a, as, a, as a tricky and interesting character, both as a painter and as a human being, has only deepened. And my 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 questions to myself about form in relation to the writer about art that that has only become more interesting to me. And I don't think I've sold anything. I don't think I have a healthier or less um, supercharged relationship with the oeuvre or with the person. I think it's it's more. I want to carry on. I want to I want to I want to keep on unpicking this. I want to keep and, and I want to keep poking at the. Um, at the hagiography and also at the the art historical record uh, uh, and and i can't do that alone i have to do that as a reader and as a viewer and that's that's the same that any of us have with the work we love and the work we return to you know so it's the thing i, I i'd say i have the same relation the same relationship with coltrane or uh, ali Fragatore or or ann carson or emily dickinson you keep returning and you can you keep your relationship with these with these people these, these cultural influences in your life supercharged with with revisionism as best as you possibly can. So I say with Bacon and, and, and the question of death and the question of art is only is only raw as it ever was for me and interesting. With the first book, Grief is the Thing with Feathers, I, I have come to realize that actually, yes, it was cathartic in the classical sense. I, uh, I it, both because it was a love letter to people and to ideas that I felt I, it was integral to my development as a human being to write those love letters both to the living and the dead. I think it allowed me to think about the relationship between the living and the dead and the life I want to lead and, and the way we speak of the dead, the way we allow ourselves to be haunted or the way we allow ourselves to be hurt and continue to be hurting as we grow. I, 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 I think it did, it did me good. I think it, it clarified things for me. And then in the magic way that when you write a book, it's no longer your own. I was then sort of washed flooded, swept up, taken away, you know, washed, washed out to the sea of other people's responses, which of course are always more interesting than my own. And I was educated, I was taught 
around the world really as the book was translated into different languages but also you know to this day people being in touch to talk about their experience of it is humbling um and profoundly cathartic because you recognize as you said at the end we are absolutely all in this together and one's own locked in this of, of the self of selfhood is always impoverished compared to anything more communal and, or collaborative so the, the 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 collaborative effort of putting a book into the world about something like that particularly children and the loss of parents and then just having this unbelievable wave of feeling and intellectual um, investigation and you know emotional you know the generosity of other people's responses has just been staggering so um that one i feel like yeah i'm glad i did that um and um and i think i would have still you know i'm someone that likes to uh, that i like to miss the people that are gone I, I i have a relatively um celebratory relationship with grief i i, I try and grieve ecstatically uh, i think we as a society we could do better to mourn um more joyfully and, and possibly exploit the dead less um, and <laughs> work with them better. But I, but I think that that book um, started me on a personal journey that I'm, that I'm pleased to be on and I know I'll always be on, you know. Um, I'm not wonderful. moving on from it. Yeah. That's, that's a nice question, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that what you said about having a celebratory relationship with grief was really beautiful. And again, not to bring it back to the pandemic, but I think that given that we're all going through this communally, I think it's really important to think about grief in different dimensions. And thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, I think we're forced into a position now where we have to try and humanize um, data. Um, yeah. and we have to do so in the context of the climate catastrophe as well, that, we, that, that human life is both related to the non-human and, and mind-bogglingly indistinct, but also related to the packed lunches and shoes and um, daily rigmarole, or, you know, mundane daily rigmarole of, of, of in, in, in this sort of extraordinary exactitude of familiar relations and every death is, every death is a, is a father or a mother or a son or a sister and, and needs, and needs, re, needs re, um, if you like, sort of re, redrafting uh, along those mm -hmm. lines, I think, so that we don't become um, immune to the, to the things that make us human, which is primarily pain. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's definitely true um one of our attendees um one of our attendees asked um sorry history dance over here but um can you tell us more about who francis bacon was um oh, yeah. so do you give a i mean like you said it's not a biographical work so why don't you give us like a little rundown for all the he was an Anglo-Irish painter. He started his career as a, uh, his, his father was a racehorse trainer in Ireland. He didn't grow up, he didn't stay in Ireland for very long. He was sent away. He was a homosexual from an early age. Um, he was out, uh, uh, outwardly homosexual at a time when that was uh, A, illegal and B, uh, unusual. Uh, he started as an interior designer, he went to Paris, went to Berlin for a little bit, went to Paris. Um, started painting very much under the spell of Picasso and, um, and Cubism, but also heavily influenced by his British peers at that time, which would have been Graham Sutherland, Lucian Freud, other figurative painters playing with abstraction and Cubism and things. And, and, and painters, you know, at that time, people like John Piper, who were kind of the, the sort of green version of, of uh, European modernism in a classic sense. And then he became, I think, unarguably the great British figurative painter of the 20th century. His themes are, I mean, the, the, myths, the myths of Francis Bacon's life, the, the key points, the cliches, which are always worth examining because the, there's a reason why cliches exist, right? Um, Soho, um, an incredible drinker, an incredible gambler, um, very, very poor then, very, very rich. The paintings weren't selling at all, then they sold for huge sums of money, record-breaking sums of money. Uh, late to break America when he did, it was huge, huge retrospectives in Paris, the famous stories of bacon in Soho, drinks are on bacon, and many, many lovers, <laughs> loved the rough lover, loved the posh lover, you know, um, an incredible socialite and, and fl a sort of flaneur of Soho in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, lived a long time. Very two famous relationships, one with Peter Lacey that was very destructive and violent and sadomasochistic that went terribly badly wrong. Peter Lacey drank himself to death. And the other with George oh, yeah. Dyer, the myth being that George Dyer broke into Bacon's studio one night uh, and, they, and they started a, a relationship. That, that's the tragic relationship whereby George Dyer 
uh, died in the hotel room in Paris when Bacon was over for the retrospective. Um, and that's the famous triptych of George Dyer on the Louvre. Um, mm. And then Bacon lived until 1992 and died in, or, or, he went to see his last lover, uh, a man called Jose Capello in, in Madrid, and then came and um, w went into this uh, clinic and died, and they say with this nurse, Mercedes. And if you are, you know, but there's a lot of really amazing books written about Bacon. He's been well written about. I'd mm -hmm. say that the two books that I would most recommend if you want to get into it, if you want to get into some Bacon, a new and I think definitive <laughs> biography um, available, I'm quite sure, um, in, in p and bookstores online and in the flesh. Uh, it'll have a different cover in the States, but that's the name of the book, Revelations um, by Stevenson Swan. And I think, it, I think it's definitive. I don't think we're going to get a better, fairer uh, biography of Bacon than that. And then the, the, the famous book by David Sylvester, which is Interviews with Francis Bacon, which is just, I think, one of the great books about about painting and about the representational art and why you why you paint, how you make images, what your relationship is to the images that have come before you, what your relationship is to the working day. How do you make how do you make such big paintings? How do you change? What do you do if you're horrified by your work? How do you destroy your work? How do you sell it? How do you promote it? Um, just a fast. He, he was a brilliant. He was a, such a fantastic raconteur, Bacon. He loved the sound of his own voice and he loved to. He loved to create his own hagiography. You know, he loved he loved this. It, the, the repetition in the work also exists in the way he spoke about himself. But yeah, so you know, the paintings are horrifying. That was the point of Bacon. He shocked the world. You know, it, the first the first famous picture he painted, really the one that, that made his name, was the crucifixion figures at the base of the crucifixion in 1946, 45, 46. So the world was reeling from the Second World War. And those images were coming out from the concentration camps and Bacon painted these extraordinary images of screaming half animals, half humans, half corpse, half, <laughs> half cadavers. And they're very, very shocking and they're still very, very shocking. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my little five minute uh, Wikipedia entry to Bacon. <laughs> he sounds like an absolute character. I mean, I'm Incredible. sure that mm. like, I mean, by like character just uh, seems like an understatement for the sort of person he was and the fantastic well, why, life he lived. To answer your question, the first question mm -hmm. about theatricality, that's why this mm -hmm. book, you know, the book has to be bespoke to the to the thing it's about, I think. Right, uh, right. If I was writing a book about uh, Sol the Wit, it would not be, um, <laughs> it, there will be no fireworks in the reading pro probably, you know. Um, Bacon has to be highfalutin, has to be extremely camp, uh, has to have mm -hmm. a degree of performativity about it, has to be slightly drunk, has to be flooded with sex <laughs> and energy. So um, that's, that's why it's the way it is. But, you know, the Bacon website is terrific if you want to learn a bit about Bacon. They, they've got the whole... Uh, catalog raisonné you can scroll through Bacon's paintings mm -hmm. in uh, chronological order on the website the official and that's an extraordinary well we, we live in we live in amazing times that you have access we to and that's one of the things I did when I wrote the book I sat and I immersed myself in the paintings online in, in the weird privacy of the digital gallery which I would <laughs> say uh, un, un, unfashionably is superior to mm -hmm. the um, institutional art gallery setup it's private. Well, there's no glass. It's free. You don't have, you know, you don't, you have to, you don't, it's not tiring. You can sit down and you mm -hmm. can see all the work. And obviously with Bacon, it's a preposterous thing to say because you can't see the marks on the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you can imagine them and you can, you can look up close in a very high res. Um, mm -hmm. And he wasn't necessarily, you know, he, the point about Bacon is that he's a sort of magician of oil paint. You can't figure out how he does it. And you can't figure it out any better when you're looking at them in the flesh. I've tried, you know, I've spent hundreds of hours in life looking at Francis Bacon's paintings in the flesh. And actually, I think looking at them online is, is a really interesting thing to do. So it's there, francisbacon.com or whatever it is. <laughs> it definitely, um, I think the digital experience definitely um, democratizes the experience of like art mm -hmm. in general. Um, institutions are a bit hard for a lot of people to reach. And um, thank you for telling us about that gallery. But I'd actually like to ask more about um, Francis Bacon and your relationship to him. Um, I mean, we know, and you said as much that he is such an interesting character, but how, uh, and, but what specifically drew you to writing about the final moments in his life in particular? How did you find his voice and how, I mean, like you said, like, um, how were you able to like embody his character in your writing? Like, 
how did you write Francis Bacon or what was the Francis Bacon that you materialized onto the page? Well, the first thing I uh, realized was that I need, I wanted, um, I'll just, just cause I'm, I'm, you know, once a bookseller, always a bookseller, right? So I'm just gonna show you another book that was very uh, influential for me. Um, it's all over the floor here. Um, this is the Inconabula, which is a really astonishing book. It collects together everything that was found in Bacon's studio. Um, and he, you know, he pilfered and stole and borrowed and ripped and painted over, you know, everything. Wrestling, wrestling catalogues, um, history, history magazines, newspapers, pornographic magazines, dental hygiene, information, you know, absolutely everything. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write well about bacon, I have to have that, that a comparable degree of mess on, on the studio floor of this, of the literary texture of the book. So I have poems interrupting, I have old songs, I have I have sex, I have death, I have peppermint, I have, I have, uh, you know, as you heard in that sample, I have people he knew. So the whole thing, I, I hope, has the busyness of the mind in the creative moment. And they're specifically Bacon-esque. They, they speak of the world he was surrounded in. And, and I think the main thing about my approach was never to be literal, never to describe the paintings as they are, never to illustrate the life of Bacon. Uh, that would have appalled him and it would appall me. And I think it would be boring. And we have hundreds of books you can read about Francis Bacon and his life. This was a, this was to try and get at um, the energy, the speed, the complexity of your of the confrontation with those images, and to include, as I'm saying, the world. So this, uh, you know, so the reflection in the glass, the cost, um, mm -hmm. the, the sheer baffling physicality of them, the psychosexual undercurrent. Uh, and so that was a, it was a it was a technical problem to be solved to begin with and I and I felt that um, the dialogue partly because of these interviews I'm talking about with David Sylvester partly it, to get close to Bacon I felt you'd have to send up or replicate or at least pay homage to the way he sent himself up you know mm -hmm. so uh, the way that he uh, the way that he um, created uh, uh, the sort of um, I don't know what you would call it, like in in in, in the line. I guess it's a sort of I guess it's a sort of syntactical um, signature, you know, like that that you recognise on the surface as a bacon painting or a bacon gesture. So something mm -hmm. like um, the little red arrow that he puts on next to the flesh, or all these, or the half cut sofa, or the little sketch line that look like a perspex box, but they're just a sort of they're just a nod towards architecture, and that mm -hmm. all that is is a you know six white lines on canvas done quickly. And I think, well, what would that, what would the equivalent of that be in prose? Uh, it would be, it would be, it would be a six, a six line sketch, a six word sketch of, of an architectural shape into which you then put something that, that has an echo of Velasquez or an echo of, of another painter. And then you think, well, how, what would, what would, uh, so for example, what would, say he draws a face and he's unhappy mm -hmm. with how literal that face is. So mm -hmm. he's drawn your face, for example. What does he, like, what does he do? To, to move the image to a place where he's happier with the sensation. He wants a violence of the image. So he would get a rag and he'd rub out half your face and it mm -hmm. would appear. And then he'd put some white on, which has a almost something quite literal. It looks like bone, but it's almost all, also all, almost a bit like bodily fluids, but it's also an act of, it's also a, an act of violence against the canvas. He threw things, you know, onto the canvas. And I think, well, what, what would that there? Well, how do I do that in prose? And that's when the English language itself has to break down. So there's a chapter in the book where the words themselves move beyond the literal plane and become pure sound. And then mm -hmm. in the, it's not so much that you're doing that, it's then that movement between the pure sound of that chapter and the more literal sound of the later chapter where it's kind of in focus again, like a drunk person suddenly able to speak. I mean, in this case, he is drunk and then he's sober. But uh, it's not so much what one is and the other one is, it's, the, it's what happens in the reader's mind when you go from one to the other. That mm -hmm. seemed to me to be quite close to what happens in the, the viewer's mind when they look at the paintings. And then I chose a death fantasy because I thought that would be interesting to see if that's close to what happens in the fractured consciousness of a person dying. Do they slip between, do they slip between registers? Do, in in mm -hmm. and out of consciousness, uh, in and out of medication, in and out of pain. He talks very frequently in the book about his pain and his inability to breathe. And then suddenly he's, full-on breathing, panting, no pain, freedom, liberated. And I wanted that 
medicated bombardment, that, that sort of um, hallucinatory realm of the drugged up and the, the, and, and, <laughs> and the pain. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely like, based on just on how you're reading it, there's, there's a frantic energy that I feel like you were trying to harness in the writing and that's excellent and difficult. Um, so I, I can't imagine just like the process of writing it, but um, I'd like to bring your attention to Diane Elliott's question. Um, if learning about or, or writing about painting taught you anything about writing, like were these two mediums in conversation with each other in a way? Yeah, thanks Diane, yeah, I think always. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the finest writing I have ever read is, is writing on art. Um, and I don't necessarily feel that needs to be in, in the area of one's own particular interest as well. I mean, you know, uh, you know, in, in Anita Bruckner, writing about Poussin or, or you know, um, or Hal Foster writing about the age of Trump, you know, um, the exactitude, the intellectual rigor of people writing on, on the visual arts has always just been a, a spectacular high point for me in, in, in what we read and how we read. Um, I also think that I, I learned, you know, when you study art history, you study everything. You study anthropology, you study politics. You know, I, I, my, my, my master's is in feminism and psychoanalysis. You know, this is learning about art to learn about the world and the way the world works. And I think it always taught me to try and um, decenter the, the authorial position. I, I think my polyphonic approach, which has existed in a couple of books now and will again, I feel sure, is related to that unease of the author or the critic um, being centered. Uh, and I think also, you know, the people that taught me to look, I mean, I had, you know, I was just writing about this the other day, actually, because they're, they're opening the Courtauld Gallery again in London, where I studied as a postgraduate. And I remember being looking at um, Manet's bar at the Folie Berger with a man called John House, who sadly is uh, no longer with us. And he, you know, we stood there and he, and he said, look at the painting. And we looked for about three minutes and he said, you know, when you're done, walk over to the sofa. And a few of us walked over to the sofa and we thought we were done. And, and then he took us back and we looked for another half an hour and then another half an hour. And we spent two hours looking at this painting and he just talked about how, taught us how to look. You know, and obviously John Berger is a kind of touchstone for me and how to look and how to think about what you're seeing. And, and I think that that sense of looking at one image and, and, and realizing that you're looking at, at the world of, of gender politics and race and I mean in, in those instances colonialism and, 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 and industrialization and you're also looking at pure technique you're looking at the relationship between human beings and how they make marks and what materials do so yeah I find it um, incredibly interesting and, and sort of a permission giver to keep you know for, for a novelist I think it's very important to keep on thinking what are my tools how hard am I looking? Am I being as exacting as I possibly can using the tools available to me? Am I doing something for the sake of it? I, I, you know, familiar formulation or a way of describing the world or even, or even breaking a line thinking I want poet, poetic effect or I want, um, you know, I want the kind of um, attention to detail with, with in the granular level of the sentence that only a broken, you know, lyric can afford me and I, or, or, or do I need to work harder? So I need to keep on looking and then particularly as a creator, like, have I fully addressed my privilege in this in this relationship uh, with reader, with, with text, with language? Um, and art history is a really good tool for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm grateful to my training in that regard. And I think that my books would always be probably have the whiff of someone that is starts visually. You know, I start with drawings. I turn my drawings into sort of diagrammatic um, notes, half sort of half note, half I have doodles and I take those doodles sometimes into more finished drawings, but usually into prose. And I tend to dismantle the prose and turn it into something closer than closer to poetry. And that is seems to me all a visual a visual process. Um, I'm trying to get at the sound, the sound and the and the mind of the mind's eye um, in any way I can. And obviously to invoke Beckett again, one one fails at that and then fails again and again and again. And so the, the I think the overarching emotional understanding for me setting out on this project with all this death around and with this anxiety and in the sort of strange hyper real box of the of the digital space as well relating to mark making was that I was going to fail mm -hmm. that ultimately that the painting is distinct as music is distinct but I think that prose and particularly prose liberated from fact fictional the fictional sentence can do a lot can get somehow beyond 
what we consider to be a good and fair reckoning with painting and, and somehow into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not alone in I'm not alone in, in that job. Many people have tried and many people have succeeded over the years in getting that little bit closer to to the mark making uh, journey, yeah, to the, to the challenge. That's lovely. Thank <laughs> you so much. The question I've just rambled and rambled and rambled on. But I remember I loved the question. I'm grateful for <laughs> it. I am thankful. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you that was a uh, that was love that was honestly lovely again like it's just so evident how you speak on your passion for art and i'm really interested in you've spoken about hybridity and polyphony and i guess like the various ways of approaching and um, of approaching um art and your work and based on your writing there's a sort of i guess and i think you've mentioned this in an interview with the new york times that you're not as interested in linearity um in writing linearity um and i think i want to extend that to not just this work on francis bacon but rather to your your own conventions when it comes to writing like you're known for exploring and bending the notions of what a novel is and more and more people i see experimenting with this form and i'm interested in seeing like how you come up with this process i guess it based on what you've said so far you draw from so many different things but how does how do you commit to certain, how do you decide on what gets onto the page? And going back to the novel that you've just written, um, how have you married your unconventional writing style with, I guess, Bacon's own sort of disturbing style of abstraction? Do you think that, again, these two styles were in conversation with each other or were they distinct? How, how did you just like, how did, what is your process basically is the short of it? Well, I think you have to think very carefully about the work, what, what the work is, and um, your tools should be completely bespoke to that project. So with Grief is a Sin with Feathers, the, the, the fables and the jokes and the children's story and things like that felt to me uh, necessary tools to try and get at the huge absence at the centre of these children's lives, which was the death of their mother. And I wanted the vocabulary of boyhood and childhood and play and games, as well as this sort of huge... Uh, acoustic um, and and literal and, and sort of practical um, starring role for for domesticity, for the fact that you still have to get out of bed in the morning and you still have to do every day, but without a mother. And so that that the, the, the structure announced itself as the triptych structure in that book announced itself as a way to get at that simple truth. And you don't necessarily need re realist tools to do that. I needed. I needed a giant crow, you know, I needed, I needed a, a sort of essay about Ted Hughes and Omar smuggled in. <laughs> um, and that felt completely specific and wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't be something I'd want to do again. With Lanny, I, you know, the, the polyphonic voices and the overheard, it's a book about village, small villages and communities and otherness and eccentricity and, our, and, and, and English, and the English sense of itself, uh, English history in the sense of the mythic voyeur. So I put those voices in and they danced across the page because I wanted to create something sonic. With Bacon, you know, again, it's like if I say so, say the passage I read this evening, right? Say I was like, oh, I want, I want a kind of imaginary scene whereby his old friend John Deakin appears and 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 has a chat with Bacon. I mean, just how how unbelievably dull that would be if I'd done it literally. You know, in in comes John Deakin and goes, hello, I'm the ghost of John, and and, and you're obviously Francis having a, you know, dying in Madrid. Let's start, talk about our famous old days. You know drinking at the colony rooms in Soho, you know, that just has the kind of crushing banality of research plonked in a novel. And, and, and thus is, is, is part of the same dirty, patronizing water as exposition. I, I, I don't think readers need it. I think it's dull. I think readers are very sophisticated people. You don't need to smack them around the head with a load of information that they can easily find on, on Wikipedia or in other books. You've got to take them to a place that actually generates feeling. Uh, and as Bacon would have it, sensation, you know, um, uh, potency. Uh, the, 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 you know, we're in the realm because it's literature. You're in the realm of the uncanny and the oblique and 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 the and, and the ambivalent. And so, so much more interesting to have a figure that may or may not be Deacon. And why has he got a fist in his mouth? Why? 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 How did he get a human <laughs> fist in his mouth? You know, that's that's that that seems to me a little bit closer to to what Bacon does because you're saying, is that a fist? Is is there a fist coming out of the person's mouth? Has he swallowed it? Is he choking? Are we? You know, then then now you're talking because these are bodily things and they're horrifying things, and they're in they're, they're in the area of um, 
of the scatological and the bodily and and the, and the perverse and, and but also the torturous and, and the unkind and 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 the, and the barbaric which is bacon's playground so so that's that's my process really is, is sort of setting something up and thinking is that is that good enough or interesting enough or what's come before it what's the energy i've generated by moving from that from a to b have I created a sequence of events that are going to flicker in the reader's mind uh, in the collaboration between reader and writer that is so important to me? Or have I just killed it dead and told them what's happening, you know? And if I'm ever killing it dead uh, or, or, or God forbid mansplaining or, or, or you know, lifting up great chunks of exposition <laughs> and in, lest my reader not understand I'm telling them about his old friend John Deakin, then fuck that project, you know? That's not the job of the novelist. The job of the novelist, you know, to quote Bacon, is to deepen the mystery. Mm, and I'm not in, I'm not in I'm not in the business of tidying the mystery up you know saying that that's why there's an imaginary crow that's why there's a mythic voyeur I, I mean I'm, I'm I'm wanting you to begin the I'm wanting you to experience the myth that's why fiction is so exciting um I you know we have textbooks <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely agree and I'm not just saying that as a bookseller <laughs> but no there I that's true um you do create like experiences with your novels there's no explanation there it's just it's happening, and I absolutely love that. Um, so I'd love to um, bring us back to the audience questions, because I think um, one of our anonymous attendees had a lovely question um, where they ask, and I think we could connect this to what you were saying earlier about thinking about Francis Bacon and the legacy that he'd like to leave as somebody famous. Um, so our anonymous attendee asks, I'm so struck by that idea of, how we make marks as humans. Um, how do we balance our desire to create and leave something of ourselves behind while combating climate change? And if I may add, um, I just want to ask you personally, what sort of legacy do you hope to leave on this world? Um, I, I'm just distracted by some of these great questions from this anonymous attendee. Is, is it all the same anonymous attendee? In which case, I love this person um, for this <laughs> range of questions. But sorry, we're doing the one, um, the idea of how we make marks as humans, how we balance yeah. our to create and leave something on. Oof, well, <sighs> I am one of these people I, I'm a, I'm I'm an animist in this regard. I I I believe in the community of people, both human and non-human, and I think that much of human thought, the concept of human superiority in nature, uh, and most of the defining ideas of humankind, white supremacy, growth, profit, expansion, uh, military, you know, the military-industrial complex, and so on. Are, are terrible abominations and that the planet would do well to be rid of us and give itself a chance to recover and that may not we may not that may not be the case sadly for the planet and and for us and for the human project and for the project of living things the project of life you know we have become death so um the mark i'm really interested in this question because i think the mark is a similar discussion to the, the idea of gesture and, and the, what, what, is a, what is a gesture meant in kind? What is it, like I was saying about the generative um, line or the generative line break even in, 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 in the literary, literary fabric, literary texture, um, what in one's community, in one's self, in one's family, in one's, in one's national or international context, what marks are you making? And how are they palpable? How will they ripple out beyond you? Um, you know, I know we get into the realm of the philosophical and the spiritual here, but I, I, am, I, I do believe in, um, in a broader moral and spiritual universe than the, than the sort of very narrow space that we live in now and that we occupy ourselves in day to day. And much of that is to do with a kind of invisible mark making of, of generosity, of support, of faith, uh, of the invisible things that cannot be quantified and bought and sold that are to do with, with, with the with the mark you leave on someone with your with your generosity or your kindness or your understanding or your patience or whatever and i think um for writers one has to be really careful with with that becoming um a, a moral project and just uh, I, i'm very interested in well in, in the gift economy in, in lewis side's version you know theory of the gift economy but also of, of the sort of trust economy 
that you don't put things out to monitor their response, to monitor their reaction, to look at your Amazon reviews, to see whether you are more or less famous than X other novelist or whatever like that. That cannot be your work. You, you have to focus on the work itself and have faith and, and do, do, do the work, do the work. In, in, in and of itself and, and try and create inherent value or inherent contribution that you believe uh, isn't, isn't related to the way in which you're being packaged, sold, understood, isn't even necessarily related to the language you speak or the language you use in the book, is more of a soul project. And I know I get into sort of murky woohoo territory here, but I, but I genuinely believe that it, it's about um, the enlargement of the human gesture, the, the refinement of the human gesture, be it explicitly um, to, to do to do good human to human by you know helping a lady over the street or to do with the quality of your engagement with the world around you and Bacon for all his bombast and for all his um, uh, theatrics actually um, and, and, and his limitations very repetitive painter very limited painter in some ways terrible draftsman etc 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 Bacon had deep in his core a, a phenomenal generosity in relation to the painted, to the mark, to the painted mark, and to the colour field, and to the human figure, and to the history of art that he felt so connected to, and to the European tradition he felt so connected to. Of what does it mean to be alive? What is cruelty? What is what is mortality? What you know? What is the condition whereby we? What what are the terms by which we translate the the meatiness to? To the spiritual plane so i it's a huge question i spend my whole life answering it, i think but i'm grateful to be asked it and i don't know and i'm and, and connecting it to i'm reading a really beautiful edition of orion magazine at the moment which which has writers tackling this question of of, of the legacy and the mark mm -hmm. um i would i would you know my religion is trees so <laughs> i would think of it as as trees do that, that you are not alone you are innately and and literally connected to every other living thing both the things that grow next to you and the things that grow far far away from you um your precedence and your future anyway i we i'd have to stop because I, I but i found that really interesting question anonymous attendee and i'm grateful for it thank you yeah that that was lovely um once again we return to the idea that we are just simply not alone in this world um and we have to consider when you have to consider everyone who exists in it um i have a a question here from Mar Marie Ann Hamilton, um, where she asks, um, in relation to what you've just spoken about, where do you find and how do you replenish your energy and spirit that radiate from you so brilliantly and generously, rich and overflowing? Mm. Thank you for the gift of you and your work that energize and nourish so many. Um, I don't feel very, I don't feel very energized some days, Marie Ann. <laughs> I would say um, I am. Um, well, you know, I have these these children, and and it has been um, quite extraordinary to me as a pessimistic person to be recharged so 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 totally by their language uh, and their uh, humour and stuff. So I'm 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 quite a I was a broody person, and and I realised why it's because I need I need young people in my life. I need their I need their energy and I need their um, eccentricity. Um, so I, I'm, I'm daily grateful to them. I am, um, I have become a little bit um, more pagan in my tendencies uh, because I, I didn't want to fall into a depressive or um, um, uh, not a sort of, um, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to become hateful. Um, uh, in my in my sort of misanthropic tendencies the last few years and I what I decided to do was be more proactive in my worship um, because I'm not a religious person and I, and I therefore needed to be I needed to figure out what was um, where wh what I could be worshipful of and how that would feed into my day life and possibly even emerge in my in my work and in my relationship with others and that 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 has been the world the trees the seasons um, the swifts arriving in the spring in the spring and leaving in midsummer um, the buds, um, understanding, understanding the world a bit more, realizing I know nothing. I, I, I'm, I'm, as far as education and knowledge go, I'm very humble and, and ashamed. I know nothing, uh, so I, I, I'm wanting to learn uh, about uh, as much as I possibly can. I feel like life is terribly, terribly short, extraordinarily short. Um, so I am, um, uh, you know, I, I, I listen and learn as much as I possibly can at the moment, and that and that keeps me going. And I hope it can be then translated outwards. You know, if someone says to you, uh, what do you have in your shopping basket? And, 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 even if you have nothing, 
you must um, invent some fantastic produce that is growing on the imaginary trees around you to be able to give someone some some gift, um, even if it even if it's you know really clutching at straws. So I suppose that's that's my current thinking on that on that subject, Marianne. <laughs> Thank God for the children. <laughs> You know, the, the, the idea of hope and hopelessness. Um, and I saw actually someone um, asking whether I'm familiar with the Dark Mountain Project, and I, I am. I have quite a complicated relationship with it, but I absolutely am, and I'm greatly admiring of some of the writers attached to it and some of the work that it's spawned. But I think that question of what to do with, ex with the existential de despair of the Anthropocene is very interesting. And again, I would say that nature is, should be our guideline rather than any human ideas. Um, this is what I'm writing about at the moment, actually, is, um, is movement, uh, movement beyond despair. Um, what, to, how to, how to, what to do with, um, particularly in terms of temporality, what to do with time if we're told we have none. How to, how to keep time's radical potential um, as a progressive force when, you're, when you don't believe we have any left. Um, these, are, these are my preoccupations, yeah. Oh, that's... Um, that does remind me a lot of the Japanese concept of mono no aware or a, sort of an ephemerality, sort of the, the beauty of fleetingness. And I think that's that's something that you touched on in a very lovely manner today. Um, it's nice because um, it, it's such a horrifying book. It's such an incredibly unpleasant reading experience, <laughs> but you can have some nice conversations about it. Um, yeah, no, we, we've been having such a lovely conversation and I apologize to everyone because I don't think I'll be able to get through all, all of the questions. I, should I do one word answers to a couple of these? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you do, did um, you do, any, did you do any painting while writing this book? Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I fail miserably, but what I decided to do this, this lockdown was like, I realized I'm never going to be rich enough to own a painting by, uh, you know, say, for example, the, the one I did was um, William Scott. I'll never be rich enough to own William Scott's still life of a hair on a table. So I did a copy of it and it only took me a day. And now I have a William Scott stuck to my bedroom door. I love it. <laughs> so that's the answer. <laughs> um, what's the difference between exploiting the dead and illuminating, celebrating them? And I, uh, that's a beautiful question. I don't think we have time to answer that. That's too big. And I think I would um, I would need uh, an hour. Is there a paperback edition forthcoming in the UK? There is in the, in the States. I'm not sure yet. Uh, it's published by these beautiful people, Strange Light in Canada. And I don't know whether they'll do a paperback. What role did Bacon's sadomasochistic sexuality play in your speculations? Uh, a significant amount in chapters six and seven. I didn't want to dwell too much on it because it has been, I think, a relatively, uh, well, uh, perhaps not a particularly generative or interesting fixation for a certain type of English critic um, or biographer, particularly in regards to the Lacey relationship. Um, and I didn't want to be dredging, it didn't, it didn't feel fair on the book or on Bacon himself or indeed his partners to be dredging that up as a kind of key focus here. I wanted this to be, um, a, again, slightly more um, a slant, or it's sort of slant wise around the sadomasochism, but chapters six and seven address um, this blurring of violence and the sort of inhabiting and um, deep satisfaction of, of the violence, both as imagery and experience. Is that all of them, Issa? Oh, if I could change your last name to a piece of breakfast food like Bacon, what would I choose? Marmite. Max Marmite. Max Marmite, that is... It's like a good name for a punk band, right? Oh, <laughs> hell yeah. Marmites. Um, okay, and uh, for the last quick fire question, if you were suddenly transported back in time to Francis Bacon's timeline, what is the first thing you would do? Drink. <laughs> Smoke. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a retired smoker, so um, I would go and buy a pack of Dunhills, you know, some kind of really... Um, Sort of, sort of posh guys, a pack of pack of Dunhill, <laughs> twenty Dunhills, and I go down and I go to the French house in Soho, uh, which is which is an iconic and fantastic boozer, and I'd buy um, I'd buy a big round for everyone. I, I, you know, I'd say drinks are on me, and we'd we'd just spend the night drinking and talking about painting and gossiping. I would, you know, we gossip about oh, everyone, everyone's dealers, everyone's <laughs> boyfriends, everyone's partners, everything. You know, that's what I do. Well, if we see any terrible Max... cliche, but you know that, that's why you got it. That's why the cliches exist, right? Because they're fabulous. Oh, they're. You they do sound... like to go to Soho and get drunk. It does <laughs> sound like a great time, and if we see any Max Marmite biographies in the future, we'll know <laughs> that you are able to answer the secrets of time traveling. 
All right. So I'm so sorry to everyone. That's all the time we have for audience questions today. Um, as we are a bookstore, uh, Max, I would just like to ask as a final question, what are you currently reading? What would you like to suggest? Um, you gave a couple of great Francis Bacon related reads earlier, but um, what's on your bedside table these days? Well, I would recommend, I mean, right now I'm reading Lonesome Dove and I've been reading it all fucking summer. I can't, I can't finish Lonesome Dove. I don't know what's happened to me, but I, I'm crawling towards Montana in the company of those um, politi politically incorrect cowboys. Um, the book I would recommend, um, there's, there's two British novels that have come out this year that I think are important books for us, for Britain. They, they remake the English novel in, a, in an exciting way, very different, oh, very different. One is by Natasha Brown and it's called Assembly and is a sort of devastatingly clinical, Wolfian account of the power, a power relationship in a, it's to do with money and class and race in, in England now. And it's, um, it's short and exacting and sort of lethally insightful. Uh, I would really recommend that, Natasha Brown's Assembly. And I'd really recommend this, which is uh, one of my mentees who I'm so proud to have worked with and so proud to know. And it's a Tottenham, North London, um, oh man, I mean, it, it, it leaps around on the page. It's a sort of soap opera meets a gangster epic. It's a fantastic book about the heroin trade, but also about um, migrant life, but also multi-generational family life. It's about mothers and daughters. It's a Turkish Cypriot. Um, it's a world in a book uh, and it has this phenomenal um, love of life and energy. She's a, she's a multidisciplinary artist. So it feels like you're listening to a mixtape and then you're being cooked for, and then you're being hurried onto the back of a van with heroin and stuff in a cabbage. Like it's got such life, this book. So keeping the house by TJ Shin, I really love it. Uh, yeah, so they're the two, they're the two I'd recommend to you. That's awesome. Well, everyone keep an eye out for it as soon as we get what them. About you? Is our... with, what's your book? Well, I mean, I don't want to be that person, but I am reading. Last <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, like I said, I was preparing for this book. I, I, but um, I am. I just finished Brandon Taylor's Filthy Animals, which mm. was an absolute joy to read. Um, but He's yeah, he's just a he, joy. <laughs> he absolutely is. I, I love his Twitter. Yeah. Um, I will have to close out, unfortunately, but um. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. so much, Max. Thank you for graciously and generously sharing with us your warmth, your wisdom, your insight, your boundless energy. We could have kept talking for hours, but unfortunately, I can't do that. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening or this afternoon. This pat your patronage is what enables us to bring it. Um, what enables us to bring you exciting events like these and. We cannot continue to host these amazing authors without the book sales to support them. So please support Max Porter and PNP by using the link in the chat to purchase The Death of Francis Bacon, as well as any of his other works. And check our website for the most current updated event listings, as we have a great list to choose from. Um, so we hope to see everyone at our future events. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Max, for your time. It was you, wonderful. It was such a pleasure to be with you. you.